Well, let me welcome all of you and thank you for coming. Uh, we are indeed honored to have our Arts Council Award recipient here from the ranks of museum directors this year. And our alum is from the class of 1988. Um, her great art historian teacher is sitting in the front row here, Jeffrey Howe. Um, so I know that he takes great pride in having Natalia here with us. And um, I thought we could start by asking Natalia sort of why she came to Boston College. Um, she has a BA in art history from Boston College. Uh, she then went on to the graduate program at the Institute of Fine Arts in New York to get her master's, and then has a PhD from the University of Texas in 19th and 20th century Latin American art. So let me start by just asking Natalia to talk a little bit for those of you who are students in the audience about what attracted her to Boston College, why she majored in art history, and how she looks back on her time at BC. Well, it might not be the, the right answer, but I came to BC because I realized that you could graduate without taking any math class. So that is the real reason. And I will not lie about it. But, um, and I came here to study communications. I wanted to be a photojournalist. And, uh, and then I took an art history class. First one I took was with Professor Marianne Martin, who I remember very fondly, who was a great teacher and who uh, introduced me to a discipline I did not know existed, which was art history. I had no clue that one could, you know, study art history. It was not a topic that was available to me as a, as a high school student. I was close to the arts, but I did not know that one could do the history of art as a career. So I was fascinated by that, and I then took further classes with Professor Howe, and I really was fascinated by the topic, thanks to the wonderful teachers I had here. And I think over the years, as I was telling Professor Howe uh, just yesterday, the, the, my memories of BC are largely uh, related to my classes in art history, more than in other aspects of college life. I know that may seem a little bizarre, but um, I think it's a sign of how captivated I was by the subject. Um, I wanted to sort of start also by asking you about Latin American art. Um, for those of us who've been in the field a long time, um, and I <laughs> am one of those veterans, uh, when we first started our history, um, no one was, te in, in North America at least, it seemed that no one was teaching Latin American art. Uh, it was a fledgling field when you entered it. And I'm wondering if you could talk just a little bit about how you've seen it develop, how you experienced it when you first encountered the field, and give us some sense of where you think it is now and where it might be going? Well, that's a very good question because when I went to graduate school, I, I was convinced that I, what I wanted to do was Latin American art history. And back then, it was simply unheard of. There were very few art history professors in the United States. I think there were only two, or maximum three universities that had professors teaching Latin American art history. Of course, there were more pre-Columbianists, but only a handful of art historians that actually did anything with art history. Almost none of the major publications in art history had uh, essays uh, regarding the art of Latin America. And this changed uh, 
quite rapidly. I went to the University of Texas at Austin precisely because it was one of those two places where you were allowed to do Latin American art history. And um, ever since I graduated, the change is really amazing. Uh, we were uh, discussing with uh, Jeffrey Howe's students yesterday in his class how if you go to New York today, uh, this past weekend, there was a pre-Columbian show at the Metropolitan, an 18th century Mexican colonial painting exhibition at the Metropolitan, a contemporary art, Radical Women, at the Brooklyn Museum of Art, a Tarsila do Amaral, Brazilian modernist at the Museum of Modern Art, a, an exhibition about architecture in the city at the America Society. This is happening right now in the city uh, in just one weekend. And it is, of course, extraordinary to think that even a quarter of a century ago, it was simply unimaginable. And I think what it tells us is that our history is permanently being rewritten and rethought and changing. And it is the liberty of our historians to explore new fields and new ideas that has opened the field in such a way. And this has to do with, we were discussing that American art had had a similar fate of being uh, not as well considered in terms of the prevailing canon. And uh, African American art, the art of women, and so on and so forth. So this ever expanding range of subject areas in art history can also be applied to, for example, material culture studies, which uh, has been a subject that has been uh, started to be studied from the standpoint of anthropology, but also from the standpoint of art history. And I think this is all contributing to expand the discipline, make it much more exciting and much more interesting, at least to me. Um, where is it going? I, it just seems to keep growing in extraordinary ways. I think there isn't a, you know, very few art history departments in the United States today that do not have somebody dealing with Latin America in one way or the other, or Latino studies. Um, so uh, I think the, the future is pretty open in that regard. Let me, let me drill down just a little bit there to ask you, if you think there are still a number of important artists or movements from Latin America from the 19th and 20th centuries that haven't been examined adequately. I think there are a number of artists, subject areas, countries that have not been adequately studied. Um, for example, even though uh, 19th century art has been very broadly studied within Latin America. It is a subject that almost nobody has studied in the United States. So it is interesting to see. Uh, there is a colleague who is now compiling a reader for uh, and translating many of the um, essays on 19th century Latin American art for a U.S. audience, for example. So there's a north-south dialogue that sometimes uh, does not converse very well in terms of subject areas. So, for example, as I said, 19th century has been studied very intensely in Latin America, not so in the United States, but this is changing gradually. There are, uh, of course, an enormous number of artists. Art history is a, a very uh, young discipline, relatively speaking, young, young discipline in many countries in Latin America. So, there are, of course, there's a of course, a lot to do, um, and uh, I would not mention any specific artist names, but um, colonial Andean art history is, you know, have, has only just begun to be explored from the in, in United States. Uh, there is still a lot to do with colonial art history in the Americas, even though it is uh, a growing field. And do you, do you feel that there are large 
untapped and unresearched collections of this material in Latin America. There are uh, lots of untapped uh, materials, both in Latin America and in the United States, that are you know, increasingly being uh, the focus of attention of a number of, of scholars, but there is still a lot to do. The other point that I think is interesting that in many places, these collections have yet to be constituted as such. So the arts are very dispersed, the works are very dispersed, you cannot easily find them or track them down. So usually work for, uh, most of us who are dealing with Latin American art history in many subject areas has to start with uh, the basic study of gathering the objects, identifying them, bringing them together, and uh, that is, a, of course, requires a great effort. Indeed it does. Um, and do you feel that, that there's been an emphasis in Latin American art in its early years on painting and sculpture to, to the detriment of recognition of some of what used to be classified as the minor arts? Textiles, for instance, ceramics. There's a... Uh, there has been, I think, a certain emphasis on painting, but there is a growing interest in the decorative arts, and I have seen that uh, emerge very strongly, especially in the United States. The Denver Art Museum has been working in that direction. There is a growing interest in design. There was an exhibition in Los Angeles last year on Mexican and and Los Angeles uh, design, the, the relations between Los Angeles and Mexico. There was a, an exhibition at the American Society last year on modern design in, in Latin America. So this is rapidly expanding, but it, in effect, for, for, for a long time, these subject areas were not quite central. Um, you mentioned uh, the Los Angeles exhibitions, and I wonder if you, if you have any comment to make on LALA. This was the initiative funded by the Getty Research Institute to support exhibitions on Latin American art in the Los Angeles area. And I think it's just now coming to a close. It went on for about two years. I'm sure you participated in some of it. Well, I, 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 I participated. I, I advised uh, one or two exhibitions um, precisely the two that were canceled. But, um, but um, this, I think it was a wonderful initiative and you see the effects of it um, till now and you will continue to see them long after. For example, many of the shows that I mentioned just now that are now currently in New York were shows that were originally organized in the PST LA, LA framework. So I think that is an important contribution. There are publications that are coming out uh, very important shows that would have not have been possible uh, to envision without that getting support. Radical Women at the Brooklyn Museum is an extraordinary show that has just opened up uh, a new chapter in the history of contemporary art in the region. So yes, I think that this is, uh, there's going to be uh, many uh, positive effects uh, coming out of that initiative. And uh, I think there has been a, also a learning process in terms of Southern California institutions that had no previous contact with Latin America in many cases and have now uh, engaged Latin American institutions, scholars, and I believe that this will inevitably lead to greater dialogue. Do you feel that this LA, LA and its aftermath um, has something to do with the younger audience that may be largely Hispanic in some of these areas? There definitely is a relation between demographics and uh, the way the field has evolved. Uh, it is said, and I don't know my, my numbers here very well, that in about 10 years, almost 50% of the North uh, U.S. population will be uh, of uh, Latin American or Hispanic origin. So 
Uh, I think it is clearly inevitable that 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 the, this growing population would exert influence in how our history is taught and and thought out. And how do you think these shows resonated with the American audience as opposed to the way shows that you would do in Lima might resonate with your audience? I don't know, it's hard to say. I, I haven't really been in touch with uh, the audience uh, reaction in, mm -hmm. to these shows. I have seen uh, very interesting uh, columns and texts published, uh, critical reviews of these exhibitions. But uh, in point of fact, I really not know how to answer that, uh, except to say that many of these subjects are as foreign to Latin American audiences as they may have been to North American audiences. Uh, that's a really interesting point here. Um, so are we, are, are our museums and your museum in your estimation, giving visitors what they want, uh, satisfying the need and the yearning for this material. It is very hard to say who can determine what the needs of an audience are. And um, I have always had a very difficult time with uh, people who say we need to do this or that because it's what the audience wants. And many times it's what the person who is saying this wants more than the audience. It's um, the, often the general audience doesn't necessarily have the information necessary to evaluate whether, it, especially when it's uh, shows relating to art that is not well known. So I think museums are there to work with the audience to try to understand how to make things uh, more accessible. It's very important to establish a dialogue with audiences. There's a resistance, of course, to uh, what some would call authoritarian attitudes from the part of the museum administration. But at the same time, I think there is a knowledge uh, that is brought forth uh, from within the museum world. And that ha also has a value. And who decides what goes on show is something that can be debated, can be discussed. It's very important to engage in a conversation about what we place on show, to be self-questioning and self-critical about how we do those things. But at the same time, there are enormous areas of knowledge, especially in Latin America, that are untapped and which the general audience it does not necessarily know about. So how to go about generating that delicate balance between audience expectations and museum professionals' uh, desires is a little difficult to say. Well, I warned you I wanted to bring in the, um, the art market into this discussion. And what you said reminded me of something that I just heard about a week and a half ago in an interview um, with Anna Summers Cox from the art newspaper. And you know, the art newspaper, for those of you in the audience who don't know this, does all kinds of surveys of museum attendance, um, audience response, ages of audience. And um, she threw out a statistic that really uh, that didn't surprise me, um, but I think needs further scrutiny, and I'm going to ask you to, to comment on it. Um, and that was that there are an enormous number of contemporary art exhibitions. Um, they are by far the most popular types of exhibitions throughout the world. And of this enormous number of contemporary exhibitions, and I think she was speaking primarily of the solo exhibitions, she found that over a third of them showed artists that were represented by five international 
Dale or Reese. Well, have they hijacked what we <laughs> well what we're what we're looking at around the world and have we abdicated responsibility to them? Well, that's a very good question and I think it is an issue uh, that needs to be more seriously and openly debated. Uh, I think one of the problems is that, and, and I think it's paradoxical that sometimes when people are tuned into what the audience wants and expects, it is tricky because sometimes they will launch uh, familiar names. Mm -hmm. And uh, because this is what name recognition can be an important aspect. So this is why people vote for presidents with the same last names etc. Uh, it happens all over, not just here. So this is, this is a challenge because, in fact, if you turn to what the audience wants, sometimes you will just get things that are best known, and that not, is not necessarily what, what wants the museum to do. So I think it is a museum's responsibility to uh, engage critically with the art market. One cannot not engage with the art market. It's simply a fact of the art system as we know it, and one cannot go around acting like one is not touched by the crass world of commercial dealing in art. But uh, there are ways, and I think that this is one of the, the important things that museums can do, is bring forward artists that are not as well known, that have not been uh, recognized by the art market and contribute to research and the construction of new knowledge, uh, a new vision for uh, what, the, what, what art is, what the possibilities of art are. I think that um, you as a you were first a curator, um, and now for over 15 years have been the director of this wonderful museum, a primary museum in a large South American city. You have both built collections and organized exhibitions. And I'd like to sort of turn this to um, the kinds of decisions you made and the kind of risks you may have taken wandering into, first of all, this, um, the field, a, a nascent field, um, and whether you felt most of the time that you, that you felt, or did you feel pressure to go with the name recognition because you had to fill your galleries with visitors, or did you feel that it was your responsibility to introduce people and generate new knowledge in your community? Well, I think... It's not either or. No, but I think that mostly it's been the second. Um, building new knowledge, and it has to do with the fact that in reality, there are very few artists who the general public in Lima would recognize. Mm. So, so in a way, it is a new question. So, we have basically uh, explored, in a way, new territory and continue to explore new territory. It's very easy because there's so much to discover and to learn in terms of local art history. We have uh, developed, for example, a photography collection. We are now developing a textile collection. We are trying to build a collection relating to the Amazon region, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. And each of these topics are completely new sometimes to our curatorial staff, and it takes a long time and uh, intense dialogue with experts, curators, and uh, artists, collectors, to figure out what that corpus of works is, how it is constituted, what are the representative works in the collection, 
in, 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 in that genre, and so on and so forth. So it has been a very exciting uh, process. It has been a learning process. And sometimes curators don't begin work from a, from a situation of authority over a certain subject. Sometimes we must start as students and we must learn and engage with those who know more than us. Often it is collectors, often it is dealers, often it is artists, family, artist family members. And sometimes we just have our own intuition and hard work to rely on because there are vast, uh, vast, a vast, there is a vast number of works that have not been documented at all. So this is a, a great challenge and a very exciting process. Wonderful problem to have in many ways um, because it's a, because it is in a certain sense a blank slate. Uh, do you feel that over the years, um, in looking back at your tenure at the museum, that you have developed kind of sense, uh, an aesthetic sense in your community and dialogue among members of your community about works of art? I hope that we have uh, contributed some in that regard. I think the art public has expanded. I think there's definitely more people interested in the museum and its activities than there were 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, but I think there's still a lot to be done. I mean, we are a museum situated in a city with over 10 million inhabitants. It is a very big place. And museums have had a, a history of uh, a very weak history of outreach. So I think that this is something that is a great challenge for our museums over the next two decades. And can you say just a little bit about um, the demographics of your audience? Um, young, old, female, uh, do you have any sense of that? Yes, we are basically, a, we have a, a younger audience just because we receive a lot of school children, but also we have a lot of uh, people in their 20s and, and 30s who are out and about in the city and want to find things to do. Younger families are also a very important part of our audience. And uh, increasingly uh, tourists, foreign tourists. We have been oriented to local audiences mostly, but over the past few years, we have been able to draw a larger number of tourists. So with a lot of tourists, I mean, there is that, the National Museum um, agenda. Do you feel that you have to showcase local Peruvian artists? That's, that's a good question because we do serve as a kind of National Museum, even though we are a private nonprofit institution and therefore do not have a political imperative. But our mission is essentially local. We bring in international artists for contemporary art shows, but in terms of our collecting mission, we are definitely a local institution. We like to see ourselves as a local institution. And we, uh, and, and being a local institution, by the way, is not uh, necessarily imply that we are a provincial institution or that we are closed off. We perceive our role as uh, that of a museum that serves a local community and attempts to engage local issues. And whether those issues are uh, part of the work of a, are dealt with in the work of a European, African, or Peruvian artist is beside the point. So we are open, we are very open, we try to be very open to international art, but at the same time we are very uh, convinced of how our local role is central even if we, even in, in the context of any interest in, in making the museum more international. So the goal then would be to choose great works of art that speak to multiple generations and um, that convey the message of a, a local message as well. Basically things that are pertinent 
locally somehow uh, that make, can make sense to our audiences. It, it's not a limitation. We can show works of international artists that have no direct relationship mm -hmm. to Peru also. But, but we do sort of, we do understand our mission as being uh, tied to our communities. And those communities could be Peruvian residents of the U.S., why not? Or even people who are, live abroad and are interested in Peru, uh, Peruvianists, uh, academics, or it's very broad. It's potentially very broad. But how you engage these audiences, whether they are close by or far away, is I think the challenge of museums. Although, of course, museums are usually very locally situated. And this is something that we sometimes fail to recognize. You know, museum, you can't move a museum very easily. So, but we tend to think of them as sort of very international institutions. But in the end, deep down, they're very local institutions. And we cannot work against that. And there's no need to work against it. I think that is an asset, not a limitation, if you know how to deal with it. Yeah, I would certainly agree with that. But since we're sitting with um, a large number of students here, uh, the younger generation, who are much more technologically savvy, at least than I, and I suspect maybe than you, but I'm not sure, um, I was wondering if you would, could comment on the role of technology in spreading knowledge generated by museums to a much broader audience. I think it's central, but I think it's perhaps a challenge that museums have not yet adequately uh, engaged. For example, uh, we now have all of our collections online. We also now have an image data bank that is available called www.arch.com. And um, we have a number of resources. We are wanting to upload most of our catalogs and put them online over the course of the next two years. And all this content is there. But at the same time, the fact that it is there, does that make it accessible? And I don't think the answer is necessarily yes. How you activate that content depends a lot on broader education policies. It also depends on, on marketing and how you make, make it known, how you make it available more aggressively. It just can't sit there because there is so much information on the web that only if you are looking for it, you will find it. So how do you make people look for it is a very good question that we have to answer and I don't think we have as yet answered it. And then there are uh, technological elements that can in be introduced to the museum visit that I think are also important ways of engaging younger audiences. And this is, again, something I think we have started to do, but we have yet to learn to do better. Uh, for example, last year we did an exhibition on Nazca, pre-Columbian culture, and we had uh, a, uh, a virtual reality flight over the Nazca lines, which was a great success. Um, I, can, I, I got too dizzy, but people seemed to enjoy it. And it was a wonderful thing because it really allowed you to see the, 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 the site, uh, the desert and the lines, and in a way that you can't see it even if you were visiting Nazca probably yourself in situ. So again, these are things that do enrich audience in, in interpretation and engagement, but I am convinced that, as with everything else, it's not the medium, it's what you do with it. It's not the vehicle, it's what you do with it. And it's how you bring it to broader audiences. Thank you so much. I think we're a bit running out of time. Um, and um, I thought we would open this up to some of our students who might have a few questions. Um, so, anyone?
would like to ask a question. Of, yeah. I'm, I'm not Sue, but um, maybe I can ask a question anyway. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about, about the arts in, in, in Peru in terms of things like government support and um, if there is a, a gallery scene, you, you talked about how your audience has been increasing, but what is the art scene like? Well, it's in the past 10 years, it's grown dramatically. It has become much more international. In fact, there are many Peruvian artists that have international galleries that don't have local galleries. But there is uh, a significant group of local galleries and uh, an evolving local market. Are they mostly in Lima? Or are they are mostly in Lima. Very few, almost no, no galleries in, in, in regional cities or capitals. So, this is very centralized, and no, there is no government support. I mean, until now, uh, there has been really no government support for artistic production mm -hmm. or contemporary creative industries in general, except for a fund for cinema. Mm -hmm. So, this is also a very significant challenge, and something that is also changing at this point. The ministry is uh, gradually taking on a greater role in the support of Peruvian contemporary art. So this is a slow process. Are there regional museums? There are regional museums, uh, especially archaeological museums, site museums, but uh, much fewer contemporary spaces, almost none. Some in Arequipa, Cusco, and Trujillo, but there are other cities. It's very, very difficult to find contemporary art spaces. What about art schools? There are a number of art schools and there are a number of regional art schools. But I think there is a general agreement that these are all institutions that are in crisis um, and have not quite managed to transition from the traditional perspective of artistic mm -hmm. art education mm -hmm. to a more contemporary notion of how you teach and think about art. Thank you. Kind of, really quick, just kind of jumping sure. off of mm -hmm. the aspect of educational institutions, contemporary when it comes to fine art and the arts, do you find that that's where you as a museum should start inserting yourself more to kind of make up that kind of lack in the, the resource? We have been trying to contribute. In fact, our acquisitions committee, we have tried to focus the, the Contemporary Art Acquisitions Committee on uh, uh, on the primary market and not the secondary market as a way of supporting local artists, for example. We have, um, we have uh, artist projects and we have been uh, working with younger collectors. So, in a way, we have done a little bit of that, but perhaps not enough. Mm -hmm. So it remains for me to thank our speaker today and um, congratulate her once again on this August award that she's getting as an alum of BC. Um, you've done all of us really proud here and certainly what you've done at the museum in Lima is nothing short of spectacular. So we wish you future successes and thank you so much for Thank coming you. today. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here.